Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is David Nunnally. I'm the, the Senior Development Manager on the X-Ray Service. And we're going to talk uh, for the next hour. We're going to dive somewhat deeply into the X-Ray Service, but focus specifically on how we can uh, leverage the data that we put into the service, the trace data, to gain uh, and analyze uh, that data to get, to get uh, interesting insights from the data. So what um, can we expect from the session? Um, we're going to walk through an analytics app. Um, and in fact, I'm going to, at the end, give you a, a GitHub repository where you can go and download it and use it for yourselves. I'm expecting great things in terms of you guys extending it. Um, I'm going to do a short high-level overview of the service itself. Uh, this is a 400-level talk, so I'm hoping that most of you are somewhat familiar with the X-ray service, but we'll touch on it just to make sure that um, most people get some, at least an overview of what the service does. And then we'll tack back and talk about how you will uh, actually build an analytics app using the X-ray APIs. And then if we have time, uh, we'll do some Q&A at the end. So let's actually talk a little bit about the application that we're going to walk through and build um, during the session. Um, this first screen here is, if you're familiar with X-Ray, uh, is what we call the service map. Uh, this is uh, what you get in the X-Ray console. You start sending traces to X-Ray. We'll start to build the service map for you. We, we post-process the traces. Uh, and. Um, we uh, identify the various microservices that you have that are making up your application, uh, the relationships between them, what we call edges. Uh, and uh, it's color coded with a bunch of information, which we'll talk about a little bit further on. But one of the things I can do is I can click into one of these nodes using the mouse, and I can then see a, um, a histogram of my response times. And I can also see various other things like what uh, error codes, HTTP status codes, et cetera, I might be seeing uh, in that particular microservice. Um, and it actually updates in real time, so you can use it and mo mon for monitoring. But uh, it's painful to have to keep clicking into each of those uh, uh, nodes, into each of the uh, microservice nodes on the service map to see what's going on with respect to uh, response times. So instead, we're going to talk about building this application today, uh, which is a scattergraph application that will display uh, the response times for any of the particular microservices that you're interested in. It, it displays uh, the top half, you can actually see the distribution. And in the bottom half, it will actually show you uh, HTTP status codes. And then we can actually highlight different areas uh, that we may be interested in and go and investigate what's going on in particular outliers, et cetera. Um, but it gives a real nice visual view um, of what's actually going on in, in one of your microservices, or indeed what we call the edge, the microservice A called a microservice B, and you want to dig into that particular relationship. Uh, the way the app is written is it um, gives you three hours of information uh, in 180 one-minute slices, and then every minute a timer fires, an async timer fires, and another one-minute slice gets added, and the whole thing scrolls to the left-hand side. When we uh, built this ourselves and pointed at one of our test apps, um, you immediately visually see things that you would not necessarily see but from the service map. For example, you can see the banding here, um, this clustering of response times in these two areas. In our case, it turned out that the first lower band was actually cache misses, and, and the upper band was a under-configured DynamoDB table where we were performing retries. But you can see how, by having something visual like this, you can immediately sort of see things you would not otherwise uh, have an insight about. So we'll come back to the details as to how that app gets constructed using the APIs. But uh, as I said, let me do a quick overview of the X-Ray service for those that may not be familiar with it. Um, 
as I said, we build this thing called a service map. Um, it's constructed uh, from the traces that you send us. We post-process process this. Typically, a trace that you send to us will show up for you to be able to look at in around 10 to 15 seconds. And we build these service maps in about 15 to 30 seconds. And so you, if you just had it open and, and have it set to, say, the last five minutes, uh, as state changes occur in, inside your um, overall service, the combination of microservices, you'll see it update in real time. And you see there's some color coding that goes on. If, if everything is great, then it's all green. If there are HTTP status issues, uh, maybe faults uh, or errors, uh, or the third one being throttling, if you, for example, are calling a DynamoDB table and we start throttling you, that will show up on here as purple. So you can use, you can visually inspect by running the service map here um, to see uh, exactly what's going on uh, at any point in time. The other thing that's interesting about this is, is that you can set the start and stop time up to 30 days ago. So, you, so if you know that a week ago something bad happened and you want to roll back and see the state of your service then, you can set the end point and the end point to be, say, an hour a week ago and then be able to see exactly what was happening. And then this is an entry point then to be able to click down into more detail and see the individual traces that made up uh, this map at the time. So you can click on one of these uh, nodes um, and we'll display for you the uh, histogram of response times um, and also the um, collection of or the groupings of any error codes, status codes at the bottom. And then you can, uh, again, use the mouse to drag uh, and drop over an area of the histogram um, such that you can then go inspect that particular area. Um, and in this particular case, you can see we've checked the box for faults, which are HTTP 500s. Um, and what that does for you is, is then automatically constructs what we call a filter expression. So in this case, we, we just selected the faults, the 500s, and what we then get is a, a summary list of traces that meet that criteria. So I don't know if you can see it. Always a problem with, with putting this kind of information on the screen. But at the top, um, you can see, at the very top, you can see we've constructed a filter expression of the particular microservice we're interested in, in this case called www, um, and a, uh, um, uh, the second part of the filter expression being fault equals true, fault meaning HTTP 500, and it's in, in curly brackets, meaning please apply this um, only to this particular microservice, not to the full end-to-end -end trace. So in this case now, we pull back all of the summary traces uh, that have a 500 error code, and then we can actually look at it from different perspectives. You can see there's a group by box there. Um, but by standard, we give you five or six different ways to slice and dice, so for example, maybe by URL. In this particular case, uh, when the traces were created, we uh, populated the user field so that we're able to see how the traces are mapped into particular users. Maybe this is an account ID or something like that. So this becomes a real useful way to understand customer impact when you're having an issue. Some kind of issue, you want to understand, is it all our customers, which it is in this case, or is it some subset of those customers? Um, you can uh, very quickly use uh, the fact that you've populated that field to uh, understand that the customer impact that you're having. And then we can click down even further into an individual trace. So this was a request. The request passed through a set of microservices. Um, and um, in this particular case, this threw off a trace. Traces can be at 100% or some subset of that. You can set a sampling rate um, or a, 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 an algorithm around how you want to sample. And in this particular case, we can see that uh, there were a series of retries. You can see each retry had a, an exponential back off, which got a little bit longer. And then after four or five attempts, uh, the, uh, in this case, this is the AWS SDK, which does this automatically for you. It actually fails. <clears throat> and you can see there's an error message there saying it's because we're under-provisioned on our DynamoDB table. <clears throat> 
So how do you uh, get your traces flowing out of your, out of your, uh, your system, your uh, of microservices? Um, there's really two components to this. There is the uh, X-Ray SDK that we have been, over the last 12 months since we launched the service, uh, busily adding more and more languages. Um, so we currently it's available for Java, .NET, Node.js, Go, which is in beta, but will, will be um, final fairly soon, Python, um, and other ones that are, are in the wings. Um, and essentially what you do is you add this SDK in with your code, um, and it, we call it a helper SDK, and it, it simplifies for you the work you have to do um, to get tracing enabled. For example, just by including the uh, X-Ray SDK um, in most of the languages with a few statements, it will automatically start uh, tracing um, your HTTP requests pretty easily uh, and your call out to downstream AWS services. So that kind of gets you going, gets you a service map, and then you can choose then to do uh, further levels of instrumentation yourself. If you want to wrap certain functions or what have you, you, know, you can do that um, such that your traces get more and more useful uh, as you invest more and more time. Uh, there's also a, a second part of this, which is a, a, a daemon, which you install on the, whether it be EC2 or ECS or Elastic Beanstalk. Um, and you can also do this on premise, by the way, because as long as you can reach us, um, and you have the credentials, you can, you can certainly use the, the service, the X-ray service. Um, and the daemon's job is to collect the output from the SDK. Essentially, each microservice throws off, as a request passes through the set of, of microservices, each one, as it gets lit up, is going to send a, 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 a piece of the trace, which we call a segment. Um, they all tie together with a common trace ID. Uh, and each segment then gets created uh, for the request by the SDK and then gets sent to the local daemon using UDP. And the daemon's job is to send that along then to the X-ray service. And um, the daemon will buffer for about a second, uh, which uh, is useful for very, very high performance uh, situations where you maybe have, have thousands or hundreds of thousands of requests a second and the daemon will buffer that up and send it out in batches. It's a pretty dumb in that all it is is it collects things and, and sends them on. It's written in Go to be very, very efficient. Um, and the important thing is, is that the linkage is a loosely coupled linkage between the SDK and the daemon um, through UDP. Uh, and the reason why that's important is, is that if anything happens to the daemon or if anything happens to um, our service, it's not going to impact your software. Your, your software using our SDK will send uh, these segments that get created. They're basically mini JSON documents. It gets sent out over UDP, and then it's just a fire forget deal. So it's a one way thing. If anything happens downstream, your software will not be impacted in any way, which obviously is a, is a critical requirement. The one exception to that is Lambda. Um, our Lambda friends did a fantastic job of integrating X-Ray directly into Lambda. If you have a, a Lambda function, you can go turn that on, um, and uh, either through the console, through the API, and uh, it will automatically start tracing the function for you. It puts a, an outer wrapper uh, around the function. If you want finer grain detail, um, you can also uh, add in our SDK to your function and, and, and use it to create sub-segments uh, yourself for your own code. But uh, Lambda very nicely gets you into the game. And the interesting thing about Lambda is, is that not only do they trace your code, the functions that you provide, but they also trace their code, so the, uh, the Lambda data plane. So you'll typically see on a la uh, when you use X-Ray with Lambda, you'll actually see two nodes appear on that service map. The first one is their data plane, showing you the time, how long it takes them to invoke the function, if there are any retries, uh, startup periods, et cetera. Useful for those of you that are familiar with cold starts that can occur with Lambda. Um, and tells you the complete story, not only about your function, but also about what's going on inside the, as I said, the Lambda data plane. 
And this kind of portends the direction that we want to go with X-ray in that over time we would hope that this will be the case for many other AWS services as well. So as you build um, solutions that are combinations of your code and combinations of the building blocks, the AWS building blocks we provide, uh, you'll be able to get really good sense over time um, as to exactly what's going on where. So to sort of finish up this, the, the, the pretty quick overview of X-ray itself, um, you know, the traces that get sent uh, to the X-ray service are very interesting on an individual basis, but also in aggregate. The, um, so the analogy I like to use is like uh, a loom uh, when you're weaving a, a piece of fabric. You know, every time you put a, a particular thread in place, you're adding one more piece of the, of, of, the, um, of the product you're trying to build. And each thread is interesting and useful and can give you information, but in aggregate, as they keep adding, you start to see a bigger picture. And so because of the level of, of granularity of information that traces give you on a, on a per request basis, we can ask uh, uh, the X-ray service a whole bunch of interesting questions. For example, things like, you know, what was the, we had a bunch of API faults uh, yesterday, what was the root cause? You know, we can roll back with our service map, look at that time period, and actually dig in and see, well, what was going on at that particular point? And we can do customer impact analysis. Uh, how many APIs? We can, we can slice and dice our data to see which APIs had problems, which ones were fine. Uh, when I call downstream to one of my partners, are they meeting their SLA? Uh, are the people that are calling me upstream, are, they, are we meeting their SLA that we gave to them? Uh, how can I tune my critical code paths? I can look at a trace, see uh, on, a, on a consistent basis that certain parts of my uh, API path, say through multiple microservices, one is being particularly slow. I can use that as a hint then to go and look at my code and to improve that. Uh, is AWS throttling me? Um, if, as AWS customers, I'm sure you're familiar that you run into this from time to time. Uh, do I have a DynamoDB table that I, is running very hot and they've started throttling me and I need to go and increase the number of, uh, of IOPS that uh, I can have at my disposal? Are some APIs less performant than others? Uh, why? And what does the stack trace say? When you, um, when you use our uh, X-ray SDK and you, and you get a stack trace, that gets sent along uh, with the segment that makes up the trace so that you can actually go look at errors and look at the stack traces and, and, and have a good sense as to what's the, the root issue. So this is just scraping the surface, but that low level um, uh, trace by trace, request by request information, either individually or in aggregate, can tell us a lot of things about our service that we're, we're trying to build and deliver to our customers. By the way, just a piece of trivia, we actually instrument X-ray on X-ray. We call it X-ray on X-ray. Pricing, they made me put this in here. Um, there's a free tier. Uh, the first 100,000 traces are recorded for free. Uh, the first million traces retrieved or scanned are free. Uh, that works out to be slightly less than one request a minute, I think, if you do the math. So there's a lot of people that can use X-ray essentially for free. Uh, beyond that, beyond the free tier, uh, traces uh, recorded cost $5 per million traces. Um, so we count traces, not the segments that, or partial segments. So if you have a trace with, say, 50 microservices or a trace with one microservice, they're going to cost the same. We don't charge you extra for uh, having more complexity. And then retrieving or scanning traces costs 50 cents per million. Okay, so now let's get back to our magic application, the so-called scattergraph application. Um, and let's talk about what it does, and then we'll figure out how we can build it using the, the APIs. So the way this works is um, the first thing when it, you open up the application, um, it will go and populate a dropdown on the top left-hand corner there. That dropdown will list all of the microservices and edges 
uh, that make up your particular application. Um, and then what you do is you select uh, one of those uh, particular microservices or, or an edge between them. Um, and the application, will, what it then does is it goes off initially and will read three hours worth of, resp of response time, so 180 slices or one minute each. Um, and then it will plot um, on, on the horizontal each one of those. So you can see the distribution and response times. And then at the bottom, um, it will also uh, plot the HTTP statuses as well. In, in steady state, uh, this will just keep doing that. Every minute, it will add another, um, another um, line, a minute's worth of information, and it will keep scrolling off to the left-hand side there, so you have a rolling three-hour window. So uh, as I said, you can also highlight areas and go and do a deep dive on that, but we'll come to that in a minute. But let's just figure out how this part alone works how we can use the X-ray APIs to build this. So this is the list of APIs that we have currently. Um, I'm sure we'll add more over time. Um, but there's just uh, five of them at the moment. Uh, there's the put trace segment API. This is how you actually, once you construct one of those segments, typically done for you by the uh, SDK, um, this is how you get the segment to our service. Now, most folks are going to use the, that daemon. Remember the relationship between the SDK talking to the daemon? The daemon does the job of sending the, the segments on the particular microservice um, to uh, the X-ray service. So most people are not going to use this. But it is there. It's available should you want to write to our service directly yourself. Why would you want to do that? Or maybe you have some special use case or um, that does, where the daemon doesn't apply, or maybe you want to do something with a framework or language that we don't yet support. So the, the functionality is there for you to override what we do and, and send us traces directly. We, um, uh, we document the uh, schema of, of the um, JSON document that we expect to be sent, and then you can, um, um, you can then send that along with uh, the information populated. Um, my only uh, thing I would say is be very, very careful that you, uh, you do that uh, if you're going to do it directly on some kind of parallel thread or something that is async so that there's no tight coupling between your application and us because things happen, as we all know. Networks go down, et cetera. You don't want us to be able to do any harm to you. Um, the batch get traces API, that's about actually pulling back an individual trace. So once you've, you've got, say, 50 microservices, each have sent their, a request passes through all of them and goes back again, each sends their segments and their little sub-segments. All of that gets sent to us. We assemble it all into, into one trace in the back. And now you, at some point, you actually want to see that trace. Um, and if you know the trace ID exactly, you can supply that in the batch get traces API or a, or a list of of, um, of uh, trace IDs, and then we'll pull back in all its glory, all its great depth of detail, uh, the traces um, for you. The Get Service Graph API, we're going to talk about that in a fair amount of depth in a minute, but basically that's the uh, API that returns for you a pretty complex JSON document with lots of goodies in it. Um, it's what we use, for example, to build that service graph. Um, and it has all kinds of things like aggregate error counts and faults, response times. <clears throat> and then for each of the um, uh, microservices and the edges between them, we, uh, it includes a histogram uh, of the response times. Uh, and that, has, that then it has a lot of uses, of course. The get trace graph is similar to the get service graph, except that you uh, provide it with a uh, trace ID, and then it will then tell you for that given request, for that particular trace ID, exactly which subset of all of the nodes um, actually did the trace pass through. So you can use it as a way to say, well, for this particular ID, trace ID for this particular request, which part of, the, of all my microservices did I 
pass through. And then the Get Trace Summaries API, um, it's about retrieving uh, sort of summary abstractions, little digests, if you will, of um, the traces. And its claim to fame and what sort of sets it apart is it's the API that you, you give a, um, a, filter, um, a filter expression to. So you can build a fairly complex filter expression. You saw a very simple one earlier where we had the service ID um, uh, at the top of the previous example. But you can do things like you know, response time greater than a particular number and uh, less than a, a particular number and um, uh, not OK. And not OK is shorthand for any HTTP response other than a 200. So you can do construct fairly complicated um, uh, filter expressions, which then get put into the Get Trace Summaries API that then brings back uh, subsets of the, of the individual traces. And um, then you can take the ID, IDs from that and plug that into the Batch Get Traces API if you then want to pull back all of the full uh, information about a given trace. So let's look a little bit more at the Service Graph um, API. Um, as I said, it's actually derived for you from the traces that get sent to the, to the service. You don't build it or anything. It's built for you. And essentially, it's returning the state of the service during a supplied time range. So as I had mentioned earlier, if you want to go back and see what the heck was going on with your, your, um, all your microservices built together as a single service, um, last week for an hour, you can plug that information in and go, and go see what that is. It has all of the component services and edges uh, during that time range that you, you are included. Um, and it has these sort of aggregate things like response time, request counts, errors, faults, throttle counts um, for each of the individual services and edges. And then uh, a set of histograms uh, some for response times and some for duration. Uh, what's the difference between a response time and duration? So let's imagine I make an API call, and my API has uh, some payload information that my code, once I hit the API, the code extracts the payload and fires up some async threads. So I call my API to dump my payload, and immediately I signal back that the API was successful. Whatever that time was would be the response time. Meanwhile, now I've fired up some async activity. It runs for five, six seconds and then completes. The total time from when I emitted the API call to when the async activity finished is duration. So in a sync world, a synchronous world, you have a bunch of synchronous APIs, then response time and duration is going to be the same. But sometimes they're going to be different when you have these async components. And so we, we make this distinction so that you, we can uh, model that um, in the, in the X-ray console and or we make that distinction also for you to model it in the API response. So let's take a look at uh, what this API looks like when we use it. We're going to use the AWS CLI here. Um, so the first thing we have to do is establish a, a start time and an end time. Um, so uh, it likes its times in epoch. So we'll create a variable here called epoch and stick in it the, the current time in the epoch format. And then we'll call the get service grass API with a start time of uh, 10 minutes ago and an end time essentially of now. Um, and so we've established our window in that way. And what we get now is a service graph. And this is a very, very short uh, snippet. And I apologize, as you know, putting this stuff on slides is very difficult. But essentially, what you're going to get is a JSON document that will tell you everything you need to know about what was going on with the state of your, of your world in that 10-minute uh, period. Um, and it will give you lots and lots of information that then you can use in various ways. And in addition to that, also comes these uh, um, histograms, um, one for the duration and one for the response time. And there's going to be one of these for every service and every edge, every microservice and edge that is part of your world at that particular time. 
So to sort of summarize the Get Service Graph API, um, it's a cornucopia of information. I was really looking for a way to use that word. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's a really, really useful um, lot of information that is done by us in the service post-processing those traces that you send us. <clears throat> so the services have a name, obviously, so you can reference them. Uh, we indicate whether or not it is currently active in sending uh, segments, the segments being the, the piece of the story from that particular microservice for the overall trace. Request counts and response times, various status counters, the histograms. And something we're going to talk about a bit later uh, is the get trace summaries time range, which basically says um, for this particular return from the service graph API, um, what was the start and end time of the traces that were considered to build it? Same thing for the edges. And then we also have uh, uh, one for the client. Um, on our service map, you'll see a little stick figure. Of course, it's not always a person, right? Sometimes there's another machine making an API call, but we chose to use a stick figure. And um, that's the edge from the stick figure to the first entry point, or maybe there, you have N of them. The entry point, <clears throat> that's where, if you look at that edge, you can see the full end-to-end -end experience that, that, would, uh, that a consumer would use, would experience, <clears throat> made up of all of the... Uh, elements of the microservices in aggregate. Okay, let's talk about these histograms a little bit. Um, as I said, response time and duration. Uh, they are sparse and nonlinear in, in terms of the scale. Um, so basically that means, that means that the histograms do not use fixed bins. So we don't have multiple bins for, you know, particular, say one second, two second, three second, what have you. Um, if you did that, that, many of them would be empty. So uh, instead, we use this uh, open source algorithm called a T-Digest. Here's the link to it. And essentially what happens is that the histograms are built dynamically to sort of fit the data. Um, so this particular example, um, you can see that the, uh, they're sparse in that the deltas between the buckets. And on the left-hand side here, the, the buckets are essentially, this is the mean of each bucket. Um, so, if, so the first one, 0 0.1 seconds, there were 22 requests uh, which were clustered in this area, and the mean was 0 0.1. And then you can see we go all the way out to suddenly from 1.10 to 6.29, and that's because, for some reason, we had a bunch of really outliers. And so we built a bucket out there to be able to uh, capture those outliers and at the P99 or P100. So it's dynamic in the way that it gets built uh, to, to hopefully do a much better job of then being able to be interpreted and to, re, uh, to rebuild the, um, the shape of the histogram. Okay, so having talked about all of that, let's go back to our little application here and let's talk about how we use that information um, to build uh, and use this API to actually build the, the scattergraph application. So the first thing we want to do is to populate that top left-hand corner drop-down. So we want to list all of our services and all of our, um, of our microservices and all of our edges. So what we do there is we call the Get Service Graph API, we ask it, we give it for the last five minutes, and then we pull out of the return all of the services and um, edges, and then we put that into the dropdown. Then we, you then select one of those. So let's say you want to select microservice A. So you click on, on, on that in the dropdown, and then what we do is we go off and we issue uh, 180 times, each a one minute slice, we call the Get Service Graph API, um, and we pull back then and, and use those histograms in the top half to plot uh, the uh, distribution of response times. And we use the information at the bottom, the other counts for HTTP status codes, 200s, 300s, 400s, et cetera, 500s, to then plot a, uh, an area at the bottom that, that shows uh, color-coded <clears throat> the various uh, statuses. Uh, we, we're using an open source uh, 
graphics package for this called Vega Lite. Again, the, here's the uh, link to the GitHub. Um, and then this in uh, steady state, every second uh, an async timer fires and goes and gets a, the next one minute service graph and then adds that to the right hand side. And then the whole thing just scrolls to the left. So that's sort of the steady state. Notice we do everything here from one API. It's a very rich API, but everything we need to do this is, is in there. Now, sort of part two is, well, once we start seeing things of interest, we're going to want to actually dig into those and, and understand what's going on. So we can actually highlight, uh, using the mouse, we can highlight an area, uh, say, outliers in the uh, response timer area at the top here. Or similarly, we can suddenly we see a bunch of, uh, say, 500s at the bottom. We can highlight that. Uh, and with the view being to going to see the, what's going on in the next level of detail, diving down into that. So we want to see the traces or the trace information that's contributing to this problem. So and we selected uh, uh, this area here at the bottom. <clears throat> and what we then get are, are, are a set of traces uh, that meet that criteria. So the, the time range. And in this particular case, uh, we're interested in uh, traces that are um, not OK, i.e. non-200 um, response times. Once we get the, the responses back, we can actually pop them open and see a bit more information about each of the traces in terms of summary information. Um, and we can also follow a, a, a deep link uh, to the console and actually see all of the specifics of the trace. Similarly, we can do the same thing up in the uh, response time area. Um, we can select an area for, say, a response time outliers. This is a little different because now we have an X and a Y axis. We have the time over which this is happening, and then we also have the Y axis in, um, in terms of the response time range uh, that we're interested in. Um, but again, we're going to get a set of returns that meet this criteria. Um, and then if we really want to get down into the, the low-level details, we can follow the link to the console, a deep link, and it'll pop open for that particular trace exactly what was going on um, in, in detail so that we can try to understand why it was that we had such a uh, latent outlier. So how do we do that second part? Well, here we're going to use a different API. Um, we touched on it earlier, but let's talk about it a little bit more in detail, which is the Get Trace Summaries API. Um, what this does is it allows you to pull back a, a set of traces that meet the selection criteria. They come back in this digest form. Uh, it's a subset of information. Um, uh, typically, it's things that are, are, are uh, searchable or, or considered to be very uh, important. You can, for example, add your own annotations uh, to uh, traces. So you might uh, overlay the traces with business information. Um, and then you can then use the Get Trace Summary API to use a, uh, to add a, inject a filter expression. And, and you can actually then search against those annotations that you put in place. So you typically what comes back from this API will be a set of trace IDs. Um, and then once you have those trace IDs, you plug that into the batch get traces API to get the low level detail. So here's example usage again with the CLI. Um, we can set our time again. And um, now we call the get trace summaries API with a start time of two minutes ago and an end time of one minute ago. And this is just using uh, time. And what we'll get back is a bunch of summaries. So here's a couple of traces that came back with summary information. And you can see some of it. You know, what was the HTTP status? What was the client IP? Uh, what was the calling URL? What was the user agent? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> in the bottom top, uh, on the left-hand side of the bottom there, there were not any annotations, but the response time was 0 0.84. The duration was 0 0.84. Remember, those are the same things in a, in a sync case. Um, so you get that information back. In this particular case, if you look, we've, we've added a filter expression. So at the top there, we, uh, um, 
we changed our time here. We went back uh, um, 360 seconds, um, six minutes, and went back and set the end time to one minute. So this is now a five minute time slice. But then we added the filter expression, dash dash filter expression, to be a response time less than 0 0.02. And so you can see that now here we have two responses, both of which have response times less than 0 0.02. So that's kind of the claim to fame for get trace summaries is the fact that you can plug in these filter expressions. The batch get traces API is then used to actually go get the specific traces themselves, and you're going to want to plug in a trace ID for that. So typically, these two APIs go hand in hand. And so here's an example. Um, we set our time again. Um, we, w we make a call to the get trace summaries API with a start end time, um, and um, the trace summaries asterisk dot ID, that's actually a AWS CLI construct that basically allows you to pull information out of the JSON that gets returned. So in this particular case, we filter it out to only be the trace ID. So what gets put in the trace IDs variable is just a list of trace IDs that meet this criteria. In this case, just the time window. We don't have any filter expression. And then we call the batch get trace uh, API with the list of trace IDs in the trace ID variable, and we get back these very complex, long trace ID information that do not show very well on the slide. OK, so going back to our application, how do we use those APIs to uh, um, allow us to dig down and, and find the areas of interest? So in the case of where we're at the bottom here, we're just interested in um, HTTP status uh, requests that are typically not OK. So 400, 500s, non 200s. Um, then we select the area with our mouse. Um, we do some time alignment, which I will talk to specifically in a minute because there's a little foo there. Um, and then we um, uh, make our, construct our filter expression, which in this particular case is going to be service name or edge name, and then in curly brackets, not OK. And the curly brackets means apply this criteria to this particular node or edge, um, as opposed to the full trace. So this allows you to sort of look at individual microservices and, de and determine, um, uh, look for errors in, in, in that particular or, or faults in that particular place. Um, and then we call the get trace summaries API with that filter expression. And then we, in our app, we display up to 100 responses um, and then use the summaries uh, to allow you to pop it open to see that summary information and then construct a deep, a deep link back into the console using the trace ID. So here we are. This is the response. Here's our list of traces um, from that area we highlighted. Um, this is. Uh, our ability to pop it open and see the summary information um, and um, start to give you information about uh, what's going on in here. And of course, you can always follow the deep link back to the console. In the other situation where we are now interested in outliers for our response time, um, this is a little different in that now we have both an x and a y axis. Um, and again, we do some time adjustment here, which I'll talk about in a second. <clears throat> um, but we're basically, we are on the x-axis, we have the time period that we're interested in, and the y-axis, uh, the response range. But again, now, we call get trace summaries API with the right filter expression, and then we display the returns um, and, uh, that meet that criteria. So I've sort of referred to this now a couple of times, that there's a little bit of uh, finesse work that needs to be done to, uh, to adjust the times. Let me explain that. Um, if we take this area we highlighted here um, in terms of the outliers, response time outliers, um, we have a, a, it turns out we have an x axis which was from 8.50 a.m. to 8.55 a.m. and a y axis which is 2.5 seconds and 3 seconds. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if we now index into our histogram, if you remember that's in the get service graph 
um, API return, um, we can see that we have two buckets there, one which has a, a mean of 2.6 and one that has a mean of 2.8. But um, that uh, three second uh, upper band and that 2.5 second lower band potentially could, um, because of the fact that these are means in the bucket, there could be um, uh, traces that are participating to that in the upper bucket and the lower bucket, in which case the three seconds would be contributing to the 3.2 at the lower end and the 2.5 would be contributing to the 2.2 uh, um, in the, uh, in, in the, um, the, the three seconds at the upper end and the 2.5 uh, seconds in the 2.2 bucket at the lower end. So what we do is we widen uh, our time here, uh, our response time range, so that we increase the chance we're going to get all of the right traces. <clears throat> so we index into essentially the next bucket up and, and adjust our time accordingly. In the other dimension, the x-axis, uh, we requested um, that we would, uh, we're interested in the time period of 8.50 to 8.55, so five minutes. So as we know, each one of these uh, slices uh, are five minute, one, or, or, or one minute each, of which we have five of them. Uh, but the way the traces potentially map to this, um, some of the traces might start uh, beforehand, and some of them may start uh, or finish before the five minutes is up. So what we want to do is to adjust this time to make sure that we are including uh, all of the traces, and that um, we're not missing any. Um, and so it turns out, luckily, that the start time and the stop time for the traces that make up uh, the time slices we get out of the Get Service Graph API, the, the traces that uh, contributed to those um, that return, the start time and the stop time is actually in the return. So we can pass through. <clears throat> excuse me, each one of those, find the earliest time and the latest time, and then we can adjust our time range. So we uh, actually, in this case, ended up adjusting our time from 8.50 a.m. to 8.49 and 10 seconds, and 8.54 and 42 seconds instead of 8.55. So now when we put these two things together, uh, we had originally asked for a time window of 8.50 to 8.55, and a response time window 2.5 and 3 seconds, we make these adjustments and what we actually end up doing now is calling the, um, the uh, API, the Get Trace Summaries API, with an adjusted time, as you can see here, 8.49.10 and the end of 8.54.42, and sim similarly adjust our response time range um, so that we are confident that we're going to get the right traces to be able to get the information that we're, we're interested in. Okay, so um, one last look at the, the um, application in action here. Uh, here's one, another one that we, um, we looked at recently. You can see that uh, on the right there, we started to get uh, a lot of banding outliers or bad outliers. Uh, so when we selected it and dug in and then followed it uh, all the way to the particular um, specific example traces uh, into the console, uh, this was a particularly interesting one because it actually responded with a 200 um, but had high latency. Um, and when you dig in here, what you can see is, is, is that this is our friend again, um, DynamoDB, not being appropriately provisioned. And what's happening is, is the AWS SDK is retrying. And it keeps retrying and backs off exponentially, does this multiple times, and then ultimately succeeds. And so you get uh, a success, but it took a long time to do it because of the exponential back off. So that's the kind of insights that you can begin to get with this that otherwise you would be scratching your head as to well, why why am I getting high latency there? It's at 200, everything seems fine. All right, um, further extension ideas. 
um, well, what else can you do with this? Um, here's a few ideas I thought of. Um, once you download the code and play with it, um, one thing you could do is um, maybe have a way in which you can put a, a line on the, for each of your services, microservices, you can indicate a threshold over which, uh, if it gets exceeded by some number of incursions, um, you would emit, say, a CloudWatch event sent to email or through your favorite paging service. Um, you could uh, take a previous period, say yesterday or a week ago, and overlay the two on top of each other and look to see if maybe yesterday you did a deployment um, and now, 24 hours later, you want to compare this with the same day yesterday to see are there any differences now that we've done the deployment. Uh, another idea would be to make sure that in your logging, if you're using CloudWatch logs, you always write the trace ID. And then you could, using this app, um, you could also uh, go to uh, do a search in CloudWatch logs and pull back some of the log lines and compare that also and overlay that with, with the trace information. Um, so this is just some ideas. I'm sure you could think of plenty more yourselves. This is where it is. Um, it's on GitHub, AWS-samples, aws dash x-ray, dash scatter, dash sample. Um, it's actually written in JavaScript and Ruby. Um, so download it, play with it, extend it, and hopefully you'll find just by itself, some of you will just be able to use it as an adjunct uh, tool in, in addition to what we currently provide. Um, and then hopefully some of you will, will be able to extend it and do some more interesting things with it. So that's it. Thank you for staying. Um, we're down to eight minutes. Are there any questions? <clears throat> Thank you.